We took a look last Sunday at the first part of the Gospel of John, chapter 20, and in it, Jesus revealed himself as the resurrected Lord. You know the story. He died on the cross, but they put him in the tomb, and three days and three nights later, he was revealed to be resurrected. The tomb was empty, the stone was rolled away, and they saw that Jesus had risen from the dead. And according to John's account of it, because each one of the four gospel writers gives their own distinctive perspective on it. As far as John was concerned in the writing of it, the first resurrection appearance that Jesus made was to Mary Magdalene. And that's where we left off last time with a very dramatic and wonderful appearance of Jesus, the resurrected Lord, to Mary Magdalene. But on that very same day, Jesus revealed himself to several other people. And now we find an evening time where Jesus reveals himself to his disciples. Let's take a look now, verse 19 of John chapter 20. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Notice first of all in verse 19, it tells us that the disciples were assembled. And ladies and gentlemen, that's a good thing. Because the logical thing for the disciples, because they were so afraid of themselves being arrested, the logical thing for the disciples would have been to scatter and leave. But Jesus told them to hang together and to continue his work even after they left. So it's a good thing to see the disciples together here on the Sunday that Jesus' resurrection was discovered. There they are gathered together in the upper room. They're together in that room. If you notice, it says that the doors are shut and the intimation in the ancient language isn't just that the doors were shut, but that they were actually locked. They were shut, barred, locked. Why? For fear of the Jews. They feared that a knock would come at that door and it would be the religious authorities and maybe some Roman soldiers with them saying, we're here to arrest you. We arrested your master. We put him on the cross. Now it's your turn. And I don't know exactly what they thought they would gain through the locked doors. It'd be pretty easy to surround the room. Maybe they thought they could gain a few minutes and escape through another way or something else. But for fear of the Jews, they locked the doors Isn't it interesting that those locked doors were also locked to Jesus? Sometimes when we're afraid of other things, we end up shutting out Jesus as well, don't we? But those locked doors were no hindrance to Jesus. Because do you see what happened? It says right there in verse 19, that when the doors were shut, that Jesus came and stood in the midst. This was a strange and miraculous appearance of Jesus it seemed that he just materialized in the room. Now, I don't want to get all science fiction-y on you and talk about teleportation or, you know, uh, he was beamed in there. I don't know how it happened. I'm just saying that what John reports to us is that the doors were shut, the room was secure, and then, boom, Jesus is in the midst of it. Now, that shocked the disciples to no end. Luke tells us that they were so shocked by it that they thought Jesus was something like a ghost and they began to panic. Jesus assured them that he was not a ghost. We'll see that in just a moment. But I just want you to think about it for a moment that Jesus' resurrection body apparently had properties that are unlike the human body he had before the resurrection and that we have presently. I don't want to get all weird about it, but... He had special powers with his resurrection body. He he wasn't limited. He could do things that these bodies cannot do. He could instantly materialize in a room as if he was teleported or something like that in the midst. That the way a resurrection body interacts with the material world is not just like the way our material body interacts with the material world. There's something amazing and spectacular and special about it. And friends, this is the great news about it. We are going to get the same kind of body that Jesus had. You're going to have special powers. Our resurrection bodies are going to be amazing. And I can't spell it out. I can't tell you all what it's going to mean. But you know, I find something appealing in that. You know how our modern culture is all into like things with special powers or superpowers or people that have powers beyond the realm of regular human things. And this is quite an attractive thing in our culture. It has been for a long time. The comic book things, the movies, all the rest of it. 
Listen, whenever you see something like that appeals to humanity and seems to have a hook in humanity, oftentimes it's because God has put an itch within humanity that he means to scratch. The itch is for something that can do beyond what our material bodies can do. I'll tell you how God wants you to scratch that, is to put your faith in Jesus Christ and to join in him with the resurrection, and you're going to receive a body that has superpowers. I don't know what that's going to mean. I can't explain it more than that. But that's what Jesus manifested right here by appearing in the room. And it was such a shock to them. It was such a shock to them that he says, peace be with you. Calm down, guys. It's me. You don't have to be afraid. I am here in your midst. Now, starting at verse 20 and verses 20 through 23, Jesus is going to bestow upon these disciples. And by the way, this is a pretty significant meeting, don't you think? This is the first meeting that the resurrected Jesus has with his assembled disciples. He's going to bestow upon them five things that I believe he also bestows upon us as his people today. Look at the five things that Jesus bestows upon them. The first thing he's going to bestow upon them is assurance. But let me read the verses. Verse 20. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. The first thing I want you to notice that Jesus gave them, it's in verse 20, he gave them assurance. Guys, look at me, it's really me. He showed them his hands and his side. Look, I'm the same one that was crucified. I'm the same one who was with you for three years. I'm the same one who taught you. Here I am right now in your presence. I want to assure you of this. Now there's something very important about this that I need to bring up. If we only had the account in the Gospel of John, we would think that there was only 10 disciples present. We know that there were originally 12. Judas is out of the picture. And we know later that Thomas, the disciple, was not among them this particular Sunday evening. If all we had was John's account, we would think it was only those 10. But friends, we also have the account of the Gospel of Luke. And in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, he tells us that it was not only those 10 disciples, but there were also other followers of Jesus who were there. That's going to be very important because these five things that Jesus gives them, the first of which is assurance, these five things were not just for the 12 disciples or apostles. They're for all believers, and the presence of more than just those 10 there demonstrates that. Now notice this. Jesus didn't come to give them a new idea or a new philosophy or a doctrine or a mystery or a spiritual scheme. Jesus came, and when he gave them the assurance, this is me, Jesus came to reveal himself to them. This is what we need, the assurance that it's really Jesus. Listen, this is what you and I need in our daily life. We need Jesus. You don't need a new idea. You don't need a new philosophy. You don't need a new self-help. What you need more than anything is Jesus. And that's what Jesus simply did. He presented himself unto them and assured them with his presence. It's really me. Now notice the second thing. It's also in verse 21. Jesus said to them, peace to you. And I want you to notice something. The first thing that he said to them, he already told them peace to you. Why is he saying it again? Well, the first time was like, calm down, guys. Don't panic. I'm not a ghost. I'm really here. This time, he's giving a formal declaration. There is peace given unto you. Isn't that a little unusual? Jesus is not chewing out his disciples for abandoning them, him, I should say, at the cross. Jesus didn't come in and say, here I am in my resurrected glory. Where were you guys in my moment of need? He doesn't say that at all. What does he do? Peace. I bring to you peace. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to have that peace between us and God. We need to have his peace fill our life. We need to be able to say that the resurrected Jesus brings peace. To be able to say, my sins are forgiven. That's peace. 
My slavery to sin is broken. That's peace. My Savior takes my fears and my cares. That's peace. My life is settled for eternity. That's peace. And Jesus came not only to bring assurance, but he came to bring them his peace. Now notice verse 21 also tells us the third thing that Jesus brought to them. It was a mission. He said, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. Jesus gave them a mission. I'm sending you out just the way that the Father sent me. This is another thing that the resurrected Jesus does. We are sent the same way Jesus was sent. The resurrected Jesus sends out his people. And when you think about the way that Jesus was sent, this is highly significant. Listen, Jesus was not sent into the world like a philosopher, as if he were Plato or Aristotle, even though Jesus was a more brilliant philosopher than either one of those guys. No, what did Jesus do? Jesus came as a simple savior. Jesus was not sent as an inventor or a discoverer. Can you think of the things that Jesus could have invented? Think how Jesus could have put together the things to make like a smartphone or something like that for them back then. Of course, he wouldn't have been able to get cell coverage back then, but still, he could have made some pretty amazing inventions. He didn't come as an inventor or a discoverer. He didn't do that. No, he came for a different reason. Jesus did not come as a conqueror, even though he was mightier than Alexander the Great or Julius Caesar. No, he didn't come as a philosopher or an inventor or a conqueror. No, Jesus was sent to teach he was sent to live among humanity. He was sent to suffer for truth and for righteousness. He was sent to rescue men and women. And that's why we are sent into the world as well. That's the pattern he says. As the Father sent me, so I send you. Now we're here to the third thing already. Jesus gives his disciples assurance. He gives them peace. He gave them a mission. Now look at the fourth thing. It's mentioned in verse 22. Then it says that Jesus breathed upon them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. What's the fourth thing Jesus gave his disciples? The Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit or we will never fulfill the mission that Jesus gave for us to do. And there's something very interesting the way that it says that he breathed upon them. First of all, John is deliberately recording the words of Jesus that lift the language from Genesis chapter 2 where it says that God breathed in Adam and made him a living soul. Do you understand what he's saying? This is what he's saying. He's saying that he gave the disciples new life. That just as much as God breathed life into Adam, Jesus is breathing life into his disciples. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that this right here is the place where the disciples were born again. This is where they received new life. Jesus' work on the cross was finished. It was completed through his work of resurrection. Now, Jesus, full of this new life, he can bestow the Holy Spirit upon his people and they received it. Now, some people say, well, wait a minute. I thought that the disciples received the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And the answer to that question is, yes, both of them. They received the Holy Spirit and were regenerated and have the Holy Spirit. But there was a greater measure, a greater work, a greater dimension of the work of the Holy Spirit yet to be done in their life. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the same for us when we come to Jesus. Yes, anybody who was born again by God's Spirit, has the Holy Spirit. You cannot be born again without having the Holy Spirit. Yet, there awaits for many of us a greater dimension, a greater fullness, a greater operation of the work of the Holy Spirit in our life, just as it remained for these disciples that they would receive on the day of Pentecost. Now, understand this. Not only did they receive new life, but they received the same Holy Spirit that filled Jesus. That's a significant. He breathed on them. In other words, it came out of him and went on to them. Now, I don't mean that Jesus lost the Holy Spirit. But do you understand what he's communicating? The same thing that has been in me is now in you. You have that Holy Spirit. And ladies and gentlemen, if we think about it, it's extremely powerful. We know that the Bible teaches and theology phrases it like this, that Jesus Christ is fully man and fully God, that there's not one at the expense of the other. It's not like this. It's not like Jesus is half man and half God. 
or it's not like he's man on the outside and God on the inside. It doesn't work like that. He's fully man and he's fully God. At the same time, it seems, and again, the Bible teaches us, we wish it was a little more specific, but the Bible teaches us that Jesus did his ministry not drawing upon his divine resources, but on his human resources as a man filled with the Holy Spirit. When Jesus walked on water, he did not draw on his divine resources to do it. He did it as a man filled with the Holy Spirit. When Jesus healed the sick, he did not do it drawing on his divine resources. He did it as a man filled with the Holy Spirit. When he taught those amazing things, he did not do it with drawing from his divine resources, but as a man filled with the Holy Spirit. Now do you see what he says to you? That same Holy Spirit is now upon you. Isn't that powerful? That's why Jesus can send us to do the things that he did. That's why he can say, as the Father has sent me, so I send you, because he fills us with the same Holy Spirit. And then finally, the fifth thing, again, just briefly in verse 23, he says, if you forgive the sins of any, he says, he says, then their sins will be forgiven. Jesus gave his disciples the authority to announce forgiveness and to warn of guilt. Now friends, it's not in my power or your power to forgive the sins of anybody else, but you know what we can do? We can announce forgiveness in Jesus' name. Because the Bible tells us, if somebody puts their trust in Jesus Christ, if they confess Jesus as Lord and confess their sins before him, repenting of their sins, what does the Bible say? The Bible says they are forgiven of their sins. And we have the authority to pronounce what the Bible says and to say to the person who confesses and repents and puts their trust in Jesus Christ, Sir, ma'am, your sins are forgiven. Isn't that a glorious thing we can do? We can say it with authority. Not because we personally forgive their sins, but because what the Bible says, we are commissioned to speak forth that authority. But here's the second thing, the responsibility. If a person doesn't confess their sins... If a person doesn't repent and put their trust in Jesus Christ, we have the solemn responsibility to look them in the eye and say, your sins are not forgiven. You will let them drag you down to an eternity away from Jesus Christ. It's a sword that cuts both ways. He gave that to the church as well. So think of these five amazing things that Jesus gave to the disciples then, and he gives them to the disciples now. First, he gave assurance. Secondly, he gave peace. Then he gave them a mission. Then he gave them the Holy Spirit. And finally, he gave them authority, and he gives the same things to the church today. That was a very powerful Sunday night meeting that Jesus had with his disciples on the night that he was revealed to be raised from the dead. But that's not the end of it. Look now at verse 24, we read. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to them, said to him, we have seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. We don't know why, but at that first Sunday night meeting of Jesus with the disciples, Thomas wasn't there. But man, the 10 guys who were there, they could not wait to tell Thomas about it. They sought him out. They said, Thomas, you'll never believe it. There we were all gathered together in a room, and Jesus came and he appeared right in the midst, and he told us he was a resurrected Jesus, and he showed us the nail prints in his hand, and he showed us his side. It was really Jesus, and look at all that he blessed us and gave to us. Thomas, you've got to believe this. And Thomas said... No way, I will not believe. Now, what do we usually call this, call this guy? What's the phrase we usually use? We call him what? Doubting. Doubting Thomas. Man, I don't know if that's the best name for him. I don't know if he's doubting Thomas. No, no, no. Thomas did not doubt. He plainly and strongly refused to believe. He refused. He said this, um, you, Peter, now, I've known you, Peter, for a long time, and generally you're a reliable guy. I don't believe you. John, I don't believe you either. James, no, I don't believe you. 
He went through 10 guys, reliable guys, men that he knew. He went through their testimony and he said, I don't believe you. Matter of fact, I don't believe you to this extent. Not only do I have to see it for myself, but not even seeing it is enough. I've got to touch it. I got to put my finger into the wound that was in his hand. I got to put my hand into his side. Do you see what an extreme level of, of, of um, assurance that Thomas is demanding before he will believe? Look at how steadfast he was. He says, unless these conditions are met, I will not believe. Ladies and gentlemen, don't be a Thomas. Don't be a Thomas in this regard. Do not reject the reliable eyewitness testimony of others and demand bizarre things before you will believe. That was Thomas. And Jesus is going to deal with Thomas in a moment. But after I have just criticized Thomas, may I be allowed to praise him just for a moment? Let me tell you what I really like about Thomas. He was honest about his unbelief. Let me share with you just a little bit heart to heart as a pastor. Look, you guys are wonderful people. You listen, you preach, as I preach, you take in the word, we worship God together, we pray together. But part of the fear that kind of comes up in my heart and in the heart of any pastor, I think, is the fear some of you are just pretending to believe. What I love about Thomas is he was honest enough where he would not pretend to believe. So I don't believe it. No, it's going to have to be more evidence for me. I don't believe it. Now, I believe he was wrong in the standard of evidence that he demanded, but at least he was honest about his unbelief. Matter of fact, maybe that's what we should call him. Let's just start calling him Honest Thomas. <laughs> I like how that flows, too. We'll, we'll ring a new phrase here. Honest Thomas, because he's being honest about his unbelief. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, if that's you, at least own up to it. There's no condemnation here. Just be honest about it. At least you can follow the good pattern of Thomas where he was very honest about his unbelief. Now, this isn't the end of the story. Look at verse 26. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said... Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Okay, this is really powerful. First of all, notice it happened on the next Sunday night. So they met together the first Sunday night that Jesus' resurrection was discovered. Then they met together again the next Sunday night. And on the next Sunday night, Jesus appeared to them right in the midst again. They had the doors shut and locked, everything just like before. Now, before I used to read this, and I go, these disciples, they are so weak in their faith. A week ago, they were terrified. They didn't know that Jesus rose from the dead. And there they are in terror. Oh, the religious leaders are going to get us. They had no hope because they didn't know Jesus was risen from the dead. But now they know. How come they didn't have confidence? Hey, we're going to have an open meeting. We'll open up the doors. They don't have to be shut and locked. I used to think that, and then I thought about it more this week. What if, and it's just a suggestion, what if the disciples said, listen, we're not afraid of the religious leaders anymore, but let's shut and lock the doors just to see if Jesus will appear again, just like he did last week. <laughs> that would be pretty cool, right? And then they, he did it again, right here in the midst, just like last Sunday. He appeared right in the midst of his disciples as before. And what does he do? He gives the same greeting as he did before. He says, peace to you. And then he goes up to Thomas. And what does he say to Thomas? Ladies and gentlemen, let's be glad that I'm not Jesus. Because I have a weird mind. And I think about how things could have been in the scriptures. How about this? This would have been quite a scene, right? Jesus appears in the midst of the disciples. He walks over to Thomas and he smacks him across the face. And he goes, is that real enough for you? How about this? Now, that would have been a pretty amazing demonstration of the reality of Jesus. Would it not have been? But Jesus isn't like that, thank the Lord. 
Jesus is so full of love and tenderness that he rebukes Thomas, but he phrases it so gently that Thomas hardly knows he's being rebuked. Look at how he rebukes Thomas. The first thing that he does is he repeats his words back to him. Reach your finger here and look at my hands. Reach your hand here and put it into my side. And instantly Thomas knows, when I said that, Jesus heard. Uh Uh-oh. He really is risen from the dead. A dead Jesus would have never heard what I said to those other disciples. He really is risen from the dead. Whoa. And then Jesus says, come on, Thomas, have at it. Here's the wounds in my hands. Here's my side. Have at it. Prove, prove to yourself that I am risen from the dead. Examine my wounds. The first question I have for you on this is, do you think Thomas really touched Jesus? It's really funny because some people think he did and some people think he didn't. Some people think, well, of course he did. Jesus told him to do it. And so they go for it and he touched his hands and he touched his side. Other people, based on a verse to come, say, no, no, no. Thomas goes, hey, I'm good. I'm good. Fine. I I see. Seeing is believing now. I believe Jesus. But here's what I understand. Whether Thomas actually touched the wounds of Jesus or just saw them, what did Jesus do when he wanted to give Thomas assurance? What did he do? He said, look at my wounds. And I tell you right now, I tell you it as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, when you need assurance from your Savior, look to his wounds. When you doubt his love for you, look to his wounds. Why was his hand pierced? Because he was put on the cross for you. Why was his side sliced open? Because he died for you. You need assurance. Do exactly what Jesus did for Thomas. Look to his wounds. And his wounds will assure you that he's full of love, that he's full of grace, that he's full of compassion to you. But that's not the end of it. He looked at Thomas, and look what he says in verse 27. He says, Thomas, do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas, I command you to believe. When he commanded Thomas to believe, the first thing that shows us is it shows us that there is an element of the will in believing. You you choose to believe. You want to put your faith in Jesus Christ? Then choose to put your faith in Jesus Christ. Before we're done here this morning, I'm going to give an invitation to anybody here who has not yet given their life to Jesus to do it. And when I do it, it's a choice that you can make. What are you waiting for? Are you waiting for a lightning bolt from heaven to make you believe? No. Just the fact that Jesus commanded Thomas, Thomas, stop unbelieving, start believing. It means that God gives you a choice to make if you're going to put your faith in Jesus Christ. The other thing that it shows us, it shows us that unbelief is not a desirable destination, nor is doubt. Sometimes Christians in our day and age, we glorify doubt. Oh, doubt, it's so wonderful, and you got to come through doubt, and you got to come to doubt, and the doubting Christian, and no, we shouldn't be so certain about everything. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please understand me carefully. I don't condemn anybody for doubt in their life if it is a stopping point, a way station, a place that you pass through. But nobody should think that doubt is the destination in the Christian life. Doubt is not the destination. It may be a necessary thing for you to pass through, and if that's the case, God bless you, brother or sister. We've all been there. But doubt is never the destination for the believer. The destination for the believer is belief to come to faith in Jesus Christ. Now notice this, verse 28, Thomas's reaction. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you've seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. <laughs> Isn't this the best? Thomas, no Jesus, I'm good, I'm good. And then Jesus said, now Thomas, look at me. 
Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And what does Thomas do? Thomas goes beyond the other disciples in faith. He says something that none of them had said to this point. He looks at Jesus and he goes, Jesus, you are my Lord and my God. And friends, that's the same place any of us have to come to in faith. What do I ask you to believe about Jesus? I want you to believe that he is your Lord, and I want you to believe that he is your God. That he's your Lord, the worthy master of your life, and that Jesus has the right to tell you what to do and how to live. And he's your God. He's your object of worship and prayer and veneration. He has this authority over your life. You need to be able to say it. Matter of fact, I don't often do this. I'm not the kind of preacher that's calling for amens and hallelujahs from the audience. But ladies and gentlemen, I don't mind saying it right now. I think we should all say it together. Let's say it piece by piece. Let's start off with this. My Lord. Ready? My Lord. Next, my God. Ready? My God. Let's do it again. My Lord, my God. You need to be able to say that right along with Thomas. You need to be able to look at Jesus with his wounds before you and look at him and the greatness of the sacrifice that he made on the cross to be your substitute and say, my Lord and my God. Ladies and gentlemen, this is coming to faith in Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus said, Thomas, you've seen me and have believed. By the way, this is what leads some people to believe that he did not actually touch Jesus because Jesus did not say, you have seen and touched me and believed. He just said, you've seen me. So maybe Thomas really did just say, no, Jesus, I'm good. I don't need to touch. I can just see. Because you've seen me and believed, that's great. But notice what else he says in verse 29. Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet believed. Is that you? It's me. I have not seen with my physical eyes the resurrected Jesus, but I believe in him. I believe in him based on eyewitness testimony. Friends, when Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed, he didn't say, blessed are those who believe any crazy thing. He didn't say, blessed are those who believe without evidence. No, there's plenty of evidence to believe in the resurrected Jesus. It's the evidence of eyewitnesses who are reliable witnesses. And based on their testimony, we can say, I believe. I don't have to see it with my own eyes. I believe based on reliable testimony. Jesus, you are risen from the dead. You are my Lord and my God. Now, here's what I want you to see. In this promise that Jesus pronounced, this means something very precious. It means we don't lose a blessing by not seeing the resurrected Jesus. We gain one. Do you ever sometimes feel like the loser because you didn't live in biblical times? You know how I love to read the biblical story and put myself in the midst of it? Go, man, why didn't I live at those times? Why wasn't I there in that upper room right then? No, no, no. Jesus says, no, David, you're not a loser because you didn't miss see that? You gain. You gain something. There is something precious that God gives to us, we believers who believe, who have not yet seen. Now, verses 30 and 31, and we'll end with this. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, And that believing, you may have life in his name. I want you to see, first of all, that this is kind of the end of the book. Now, there's one more chapter, and we'll get into that next week. But the one more chapter is like an appendix added to the end. There's a sense in which this is the end of the book. And John has completed what he's tried to do. He's laid out the signs that Jesus did. Why? That you and I may believe. And if you believe, you'll have life in his name. And so that's a simple challenge that goes out to you right now. Will you believe in Jesus? Will you put your trust in him? And I believe all over there's hearts just saying, yes, yes. Jesus, I believed on you years before, but I believe upon you all over again. But I give a call out now. I'll be something of an evangelist right now. And I said before, I'll give everybody here the opportunity to make a decision. Now is your moment to say, I will put my faith in Jesus Christ. I will put my trust in him. I'll give you that opportunity just in a moment as we pray. And I'll tell you what I'll do. If you're going to make a decision of Jesus Christ, when I pray in a moment, I'll ask you to stand. But please understand this. It's not complicated. I'm not saying it's easy. 
It's not easy to become a Christian. Excuse me, it's not, it's not easy to live the Christian life, but it's not complicated. You want to know how simple it is? It's as simple as A, B, C. All you have to do is accept, that's A, believe, that's B, and commit, that's C. Accept that Jesus is who he said he was, and he did what the Bible said he did. Believe on him, put your trust in him, and trust your life to him, and commit to him. Truly surrender your life in everything you are and everything you have to him. That's simple, isn't it? I'm not saying it's easy, but it's not complicated. This is God's invitation to you today. I'm going to pray, and in the midst of my prayer, I'm going to give an invitation to anybody who wants to make that decision. Let's pray right now. Father in heaven, thank you. We come together before you, Lord, as, as a group of people. We just say right along with Thomas, my Lord, my God. But Father, I, I just think if there's anybody here who needs to say that, really for the first and unique time today, I pray that you'd give them the ability and the effort to do that, Lord. I pray that you would help them to decide to pass from believing, excuse me, from unbelieving unto believing. And Lord, I know that even though they have a choice in this, they can't make that choice unless you work upon them. So I pray, God, that you work upon them even now to give them the very choice, to give them the very belief that they'll have to choose to take. Do it, Lord, in our midst right now. Now, as I pray, I just want to give a very simple invitation. If today is your day and you want to make a decision to put your trust in Jesus, if you want to do the ABCs, of accept, believe, and commit, I just ask you to stand to your feet right now where you are. Anybody here this morning? Stand to your feet. God bless you in the back. God bless you, man. Who else here? There were several in our first service and there may be more right here. God bless you. Any others here? I'll give it just a moment. God bless you. Who else in our midst? Let me pray a prayer for those of you who are standing. Jesus, I come to you and I simply want to do those three things. I want to accept you, Jesus, and everything you are and everything you did. I want to believe upon you, truly putting my trust in you and not in myself. And Jesus, I commit my life to you in all the surrender that I can give unto you. Lord, please take my sin and give me your righteousness. Give me your new life. I give you my death. I receive your life. Take it now and give me new life in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Welcome to the family of God.